Welcome back to episode 5 of How Flutter Works. In this section, we'll examine those render objects we learned are being created by any render object widgets in the widget tree. If you haven't seen episode 4 on render object widgets, I do recommend starting there. Unlike the fairly simple render object widgets, actual render objects are pretty complicated and do many jobs within Flutter. For most developers, a casual understanding of how they work is sufficient. And because that's what most developers need, that is also the target depth of this video. However, someone actually has to write and debug render objects. And if that someone is ever you, I've linked deeper dives in the video description, including my technical talk, The Life Cycle of a Render Object, which goes into much greater detail. A render object's four primary methods to know about are in the service of accessibility, layout, painting, and hit testing which is identifying which UI element a user touched or clicked on. Note that technically, render objects could behave differently than this. And really, it's just the render box that implies the following API contract. But in practice, pure render objects are too abstract to be very useful. Render boxes introduce the 2D Cartesian coordinate system that you would expect. So almost all render objects subclass render box. For this reason, we can treat render box details as foundational. That first method, layout, has one job, figure out how big the thing should be given whatever constraints were inherited from the parent. Within the contract of the render box, the layout method saves that value in an all important size attribute, which will be read later. The second method, paint, begins to queue up graphics operations with a mutable canvas object it receives as a parameter. Note that functions you might find in a render objects paint method, like draw rect, do not actually produce a pixel buffer. Instead, they store the concept of a rectangle, which will later be evaluated by impeller or skia and run through a shader. Let's pause here, because we've just covered something fundamental, though it was probably obscure. There's a saying in Flutter, which describes the layout and rendering algorithm, which goes like this. Constraints go down, sizes go up, parent sets position. That describes the interactions between various layers of render objects and how they collectively figure out where everything should go. Think of it like this. I am a given render object, and my parent informs me that I have 100 by 100 pixels available to play with. Maybe I'm a render padding object, so I first apply my own rules by subtracting however much padding was specified by my padding widget. I then call my descendant widgets layout method, sending in the reduced values as its constraints. So there it is. The constraints are going down. The second part of the saying is that sizes come up, which also happens in the layout method. If this render object needs its child's size, it can now factor that in to further calculations. Of course, don't forget, we also have to set our size attribute for our parent, a render padding usually takes all of its available space, but not all render objects do. A render object who renders text, for example, uses its font file to lay out the required characters and then only uses that much space. So now we've seen constraints going down the render tree and sizes bubbling back up. The final part, the parent setting the position, happens over in the paint method in the form of whatever graphics calls it makes. Here, the parent render padding object sets the position of its child by well, applying the padding. You might have heard of this phrase about constraints, sizes, and positions before, and I think it's fun to see the lines of code that make it happen. The third job of render objects, hit testing, is actually a lot simpler than I first imagined it would be. In all of Flutter, only render objects know their location and size, so of course it always had to be them which resolved hit testing. When a user clicks or touches their screen, the browser or host operating system passes their raw gesture information to the Flutter engine, which in turn forwards everything along to the Flutter framework. The framework then drills into the render tree, asking each render object a simple question. Are these coordinates within your bounds? Each render object answers that question and typically allows its children to answer. Deciding which gesture callbacks to invoke if more than one render object added itself to that hit test result object is a concern of a different system altogether within Flutter, the gesture arena. For more information on that, see the links in the video description below. The final job of render objects, semantics, happens within the method describe semantics configuration. This method populates a semantics object, which the Flutter engine will sync with the browser or host operating system.
This ensures that screen readers and other accessibility tools always know the latest information to show users. Render objects have more jobs than this, including clever caching of values, segmenting layers of the UI, and more. But so far, you've got the highlights. After all of this is complete, each render object's paint method has recorded drawing operations to the canvas objects they accepted as positional parameters. The various canvas objects that all of your render objects wrote operations to in their paint methods are ultimately passed to the Flutter engine to execute shaders, resolve things like clipping and opacity, and then eventually rasterize all of those results into a pixel buffer. For more information about that process, definitely watch the talk, The Lifecycle of a Render Object, linked below. In the meanwhile, there's more interesting stuff to cover behind how a render object moves from one frame to the next. And yes, unlike widgets, render objects live as long as possible, often supporting many frames in one lifetime. In the last episode, we saw how an element calls its widgets create render object and update render object methods, and we looked at a typical version of update render object like this. I tease that these attribute assignments were magic setters with fancy inner workings and that we'd look at them later. Well, later has finally arrived. It works like this. Imagine we're writing a render object to display a string. By convention, we'll call it render string. Render objects save their values on mutable private fields, then employ a proxy getter and setter. The getter is straightforward, but the setter sees to a few other issues. First, the magic setters have a guard statement for when the incoming value is the same as the old value, because then none of the ensuing trickery is needed. But if the new value is in fact different, then the setter calls several of three possible methods. To understand these methods, let's briefly return to three of the top level methods we talked about earlier, layout, paint, and describe semantics configuration. Each of these top level methods determines various details about how to render this part of the UI. And of course, all of these decisions are derived from whatever values the render object received from its widget. For our render string class, layout will determine how much size the letters in the string will take up. Paint will evaluate the font's SVGs in order to render the individual letters. And describe semantics configuration will update the string in the accessibility tree for screen readers. If our string was rendered with a text style, then that style's font size would affect layout, and its font color could affect painting. You get the idea. Well, whenever one of these magic setters executes and changes information that was used in one of the three top-level methods, then the render object must call the associated companion method, which are all prefixed with mark needs. There's no static analysis for this. If you're writing a render object, it's up to your human brain to remember to call the correct methods. If you don't, your render object will correctly render initial values on its first frame, but then never update later on, no matter what its new widget tells it in update render object. With this in mind, we can return to that magic setter and complete its last lines. Because changing the value of the string we need to render will probably take up a different amount of space, we must call mark needs layout. And because it definitely will have to repaint, otherwise it would continue to show the old letters, it also needs to call mark needs paint. However, there's a minor gotcha here, which is that laying out a render object always implies a repaint, so we can actually drop the mark needs paint call. Lastly, it can't forget this new string value will need to be made available to screen readers and other accessibility tools, so it should call mark needs semantics update in its place. Calling these two mark needs methods within a magic setter will ensure this render object properly reacts to any changes it receives from a widget's update render object method and renders evolving values from one frame to the next. That completes a day in the life of a render object. We've come a long way, exploring the interplay between each of Flutter's most popular trees. In the next and final episode of this series, we'll examine what lies below all of our Dart code and answer questions like, Engine room, what's going on down there? And a flutter and better. What the heck is that? See you there. <laughs>